All right, last lesson we talked about what it means to live by faith. In this session, we're going to talk about how we put that in action through prayer. And I've got three key texts that I wanted to use tonight. And uh, Dana, if you'd like to start off reading 135, you can read right off the outline. Okay. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, Jesus went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. That's right. And Bobby, you want to do the next one, Luke 612? And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a, a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God, Luke 612. Do you ever, when you study the Gospels, get really strong visual images in your mind of what's going on? I would love to have watched Jesus pray, to have, have set in on the conversations he had with the Father. I mean, the Gospels give us some glimpses. But when you see how he would get up way before daybreak or that he would be in prayer all night, you ever wonder what he was talking to God about, mm -hmm. for God the Father? Yeah. I do. And he took that even to the cross with him. We see next Luke 23, 34, then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. He even took that prayer to the people who were crucifying him. I put, in a, I put the verse Isaiah 53, 12 here. He interceded for the transgressors. That was prophesied. Mm -hmm. But... You know, we look at we need to look at Jesus as being the example of everything in our life. But you know, we're studying about prayer tonight, and if there was anyone that could give a, a pass on prayer, it'd be Jesus. I mean, he was God in the flesh, but he still saw a need for a regular, disciplined prayer life. He need, had to get up early. He had to spend the whole night in prayer. And I mean, if he needed that, how much more do we? Amen. Okay, again, we'll start in some basic definitions here. I won't spend too much time here, but. What is prayer, Greek, I-T-O, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, which means to ask, to crave, to desire, or to require or demand. Now, this last one can be a little confusing if we don't understand it properly. To say we're demanding in prayer doesn't mean we're giving God orders. Right. Look at it in terms of making a demand on what he's made available. Like we walk into a room and we turn on the light, we're making a demand on the power that the electricity gives us. And when we pray and ask God for something, we're making a demand on the provision He's already made for us. But that always has to be with the proper reference, reverence. I'm sure you understand that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to go in now to the Latin word pater noster, or the Lord's Prayer, or some would call it the Disciples' Prayer that Jesus taught us how to pray. You know, the disciples came specifically and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And, you know, what more noble of a request could we give to the Lord than that? Show us the way we can pray in a way that honors you. Amen. Mm -hmm. We'll go into Luke 11. There are actually two instances where this is recorded in the Gospels. One in Matthew. I'm going to read the one in Luke. Um, the wording is a little different, but they're both saying the same thing. Keep in mind, you know, this is a translation of a Greek text that, you know, two people were describing what they saw. You know, it's not a contradiction. It's just maybe one might be emphasizing some things, the other doesn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Luke 11, starting with chapter 1. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying, there he's praying again, they catch him. As he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said, This is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. Uh, you want to read that out of your King James, Dana, because that's going to be a more familiar wording of it. Okay, you want to start in verse 2. Uh, yeah, that's fine. And he said unto them, When you pray... Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mm -hmm. Let's see, that's all of that. Okay. Okay, what he's given us here is a pattern for prayer. It's not necessarily saying we have to use these words verbatim every time we pray, even though there's nothing wrong with doing that from time to time. But uh, 
He's given us a pattern to follow that I've divided up into several sections that, and this is how I follow in my own personal prayer life. Acknowledgement, our Father who art in heaven. That word our is a powerful word in itself. That is a sign of unity with the whole Christian world. All believers, when we pray, addressing our Father, worshiping that same God. And Father, we go back to that Father heart we were talking about in the faith image, Abba, Father, Daddy. He's God to the world, but He's Father to us. Mm -hmm. Amen. who art in heaven. Then we go into adoration, hallowed be thy name. This is the time to spend in worship and praise to God. Thank him for the good things he's done for you. In consecration, thy kingdom come. We're submitting ourselves to the greater good of his kingdom coming on the earth. Submission, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, it's not our will, but his we're after. And then petition, give us this day our daily bread. This is when we pray for our own needs or the needs of others. Obviously, you know, we pray for kings and people in authority, for the president in our case, or in all other leaders. We pray for, as Pastor was talking about, the peace of Jerusalem. We should pray for our church. We should pray for ministries. We should pray for people who are in need. You know, whatever the need may be. And of course, pray for our own personal needs too. Then confession, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. When we talk about faith and prayer, that keeps popping up more and more, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something the Lord wants us to, He wants us to stay out of strife. The book of James says that where that is, there's every evil work. And we want to talk about don't give place to the devil. I mean, that's the number one way to do it. I mean, when we give ourselves over to strife, bitterness, and unforgiveness, we're, we're leaving the door wide open for the enemy. Okay, the next section is for protection and deliverance, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's pretty well self-explanatory. And then we end it the way we started with praise and worship. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's powerful. I heard some teaching on that. I guess it's been, gosh, 15, 16 years ago. And you know, I've been using that as my pattern for prayer ever since then. And it's, it's, it's really helped me to you know, keep that in mind. Okay, next we're going to talk about keys to answered prayer. And again, this is not going to be an exhaustive list. There's a lot more, but, you know, we don't have so much time. But this is a good place to start. Uh, John chapter 14. Verses 12 through 15. Okay, and Bobby, would you like to read that one? Sure, 12 through 15. Yes. Okay. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Okay, that is... This comes from the same discussion we talked about a couple of weeks ago, just before Jesus was going to go to, to uh, Gethsemane to pray, then be arrested and crucified. He's giving the disciples some parting words here. And he's talking about the ability to use his name, and that is giving you power of attorney. If, like, when you, when you guys got married, you know, uh, you took on, you, you gave up your maiden name and you took on Dana's name, and you took on power of attorney to use that name, you have access to everything he has. Like, and... When you have that power of attorney, you just you can use it to gain access to that person's resources. And Jesus was giving the power of attorney to use his name. And when we go to the Father and use his name, we're coming not in our own name but in his. And we have access to everything Jesus has. That's powerful. Yes. E.W. Kenyon's book, The Wonderful Name of Jesus, I want to put in a plug for that. It's on the recommended reading, but get that book immediately, if not sooner. That, that It'll change your prayer life. Well, you've got the one from Kenneth Hagin. That's a good one, too. But the Kenyon book, I've heard of that or something. You can get it. A Christian bookstore could order it for you, or you can get it on the Internet, either one. Didn't we have that on Kenneth? Oh, it's on this list, I believe. Okay, okay yeah. The yeah. The name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the next one, we just have to flip over a page to get there. John fifteen seven. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything you want and it will be granted. 
I remember the church I previously went to, I was being trained to um, do the phone counseling for the TV broadcast or the phone prayer. It's not professional counseling, but you know what I mean. And I sat in with a lady who'd done it for a long time, and uh, she got a call from someone and who had an unspoken request. And she said, uh, I, I can't take unspoken requests. I need to know what you're, I'm praying with you so I can agree with you. And after she hung up the phone, I'd never heard that before, but she said, uh, for all I know, she might want me to pray for her to have somebody else's husband. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's always stuck with me. When, when we pray, we need to know that we're praying in accordance with God's will, and the best way to do that is to pray in accordance to the Word. We know that's not going to lead us wrong. I, I have some of those um, prayers that avail much books that are prayers for a lot of different needs that are almost completely word-for-word word scripture. You can get those, or you can just, you know, take your own Bible and mark verses that are relevant to that. You could, I mean, I do both. But, you, you know, pray in the Word is the best way to pray. Okay, and then we'll flip, flip over to the book of James. My book. <laughs> okay. I just have um, James 1 6, but why don't you go ahead, Dana, and read uh, verses 6 through 9. That's all important. Okay. Uh, r- verse 8, I'm sorry. Okay, 6 through 8. Yeah. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's when we get into unbelief, and it's easy to do if we're not careful, but we don't realize how serious that is. We're taking the God of truth and accusing him of lying. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, you know, Jesus talked about a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If we start giving place even to a little bit of unbelief or doubt in our hearts, that'll throw our whole prayer life off. That's why we have to get back to developing our faith the way we discussed in the previous lesson. And I, this is another thing I've talked about, but this word double-minded, you know, that's a powerful word too. It means when your natural mind and your spiritual mind are out of harmony with each other. Amen. Okay, and then finally we're going to go back to Philippians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, go eat popcorn. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, you want to read that, Dana? Yeah. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication... With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Notice it says include the thanksgiving up front. You know, we thank him even though we may not see it. And sometimes we don't see it for a while, but we have to go ahead and thank him in advance as though we already have it. That's what faith is. Faith takes the past tense of what God's already provided and brings it into the present. And we may not see the manifestation of it until sometime in the future, but we have to believe it's ours now. Amen? Amen. Okay. Hindrances to answered prayer, and I've got a lot of scripture here. We won't take time to look at them tonight, but uh, you can look, look those up on your own. And if those of you are listening to this CD, out, that you can you can uh, download the outline off the web page if you like. Unbelief, lack of faith. We just talked about that. Lack of knowledge and understanding. Let's go ahead and take a look there at Hosea four six back in the Old Testament. That's after Daniel. Mm, (coughs) Excuse me. Okay. Bobby's about to read that one. I'm sorry, Hosea Hosea 4 6. 6. Yes. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. 
Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I also will ignore your children. It tells us there that the lack of knowledge of God's word and God's precepts can destroy us. And it goes back to when we're talking about faith, of understanding what, how God's word applies to our life. People who may not have been taught the way we have about healing and prosperity and things like that, it's not that they don't love God or that they're bad people, but they don't have the knowledge to appropriate that into their lives. And it's been said that where you go to church can mean the difference between life and death. If you're not in a church that teaches you how to stand on that, then you can die before your time easily. And we have to understand what God's Word says, how to apply it to our lives, and feed ourselves a steady diet of that. Amen? Amen. Okay, and pray, okay, C is praying for things that are inconsistent with God's nature and will. We've already talked about that. Uh, D, wrong priorities, Matthew 6, 33. Hmm? This is the scripture that's been coming to my mind. Seek first the kingdom. Okay. And his righteousness. Why don't you go ahead and read that then? Yeah, chapter 6. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Okay. You, you said God's been bringing that to your mind. You, you mind elaborating about that a little bit? Well, I mean, when you were just mm -hmm. uh, talking about it, and you were saying putting things in perspective, well, I guess that's what you're saying. But anyway, if you... Seek first the kingdom of God, just like the scripture says, then the rest of it will be added to sure. you. Have to put, you have to put things in. Sure. Prioritize, I guess, is what I'm trying to say or whatever. And there's actions that go along with that. Exactly. You know, and, but, you know, we have to show God that by our lifestyle, you know, James says faith without works or corresponding actions is dead. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when Jesus um, spit on the ground, made the clay, put it on the blind man's eyes and told him to go wash. You know, he had to do that as an act of faith. Could Jesus have healed him without doing that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he puts conditions on that. And, that, you know, that may take on different forms for different people. You know, we want God to bless us financially, but we have to be willing to trust him to, with our tithes and offerings and our other kinds of giving. You know, that's a, an easy example. To, you know, when we, we have to be able to trust him to, when we go to our work, to do our jobs with integrity and to, you know, to live right. Okay, unconfessed sin. I don't have this written down, but um, I think it's in Psalms. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. In the, in the first John, it says, you know, we know that we receive what we ask of him because we keep his commandments, do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You know, if we don't keep his commands, do those things that are pleasing in his sight, then we don't have that assurance. I mean, I'm not saying God would be merciful and answer a prayer for you. He, you know, none of us are perfect, and we all have to have that mercy. But, you know, our, our heart... To, before we can we can have that assurance of answer prayer, our our heart has to be right toward Him. Okay. Unforgiveness again, we've already talked about that. I just had a thought of First John one verse nine: uh -huh. if We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sure. And I'm glad you mentioned that, Dana. That word confess, it's interesting, means to agree with God. You know, we we stop arguing with God and justifying our sin. We agree with Him that it's wrong and we're willing to come to terms with it. That's a powerful mm -hmm. statement. Thank you for sharing that. What was that? First John 1, verse 9. Okay. Okay, then finally we're going to get into what we discussed about praying in the Spirit or praying in other tongues. And, you know, we as charismatic believers, we have that as a doctrinal stance. Mm -hmm. uh, churches that are outside of ours, you know, have different approaches to it, but they, a lot of times they think of us as we got the rattlesnakes going around our necks, foaming at the mouth, swinging from the chandeliers right. and things. You know, that's not the way it is at all. I mean, it's simple a matter of we believe we can, we can have an intimacy with God that, to be blunt, your average Christian doesn't have. But it's not that they can't have it. It's available to them if they're willing, willing to seek God for it. And that's not a hard process. It seems that the, the Baptist and I'm not sure how Methodists and all of those feel, but a lot of those folks feel that if you speak in tongues, you're, you're, uh, 
being influenced by the devil. In some cases, not all Baptists think that way. Um, but uh, I, I actually did have a, an associate pastor at a church I used to go to that said he served the devil for 20 years before he got saved and the devil never one time had him speak in tongues, you know. But, you know, that's a humorous point. But, you know, Jesus promises that if you ask him for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. If you're sincerely seeking God, you know, you don't have to worry about that. Right. But, you know, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I was just trying to remember who I heard say that because the church we came from thought that speaking in tongues was of the devil. Mm-hmm. And she said that one night she believed that it was speaking to the devil or of the devil and the next night she's speaking in tongues and it changed just that fast for her. Mm-hmm. I can't remember who I heard say that. But it, it was it's funny because yeah. I thought I've heard my whole life. Well you know with me, uh, before I got spirit filled I went to a denominational church that was on the liberal side and you know that was one of the reasons I left but another reason I left was because I was starting to learn more about the spirit filled like I, was, I remember I was in Ohio visiting with my uncle on vacation. I was just flipping channels on TV, and I saw a, um, it was part of Oral Roberts' Charismatic Bible Ministries Conference, and uh, I kind of discovered I was charismatic and didn't know it. <laughs> uh, there was an African-American pastor, minister there. I don't know who he was, but uh, he was preaching on God is still God. A lot of people don't believe God can part the seas now, but he's the same God he's always been. And that resonated with me. And that was, plus some people I'd known who were spirit filled who I knew had a depth to their spiritual life that I didn't. All those things led me up to, to seek this out. But the, the church that I went to before, it wasn't that I was taught against it, it just wasn't really mentioned either way. And that was to an advantage to me because, you know, I didn't have a lot of preconceived notions coming in. You know, I mean, they say Catholics are easy to get filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, because they come from of a tradition where they're taught to believe in miracles, you know, where some Baptists, I don't want to broad brush, but, you know, some Baptists may be a little bit more hesitant to accept that, but Baptists have a lot of important insights into other areas, too. You know, we're all one body, and we've all got yeah. things we bring to the table. Yeah. And, you know, just because, like, you know, my Baptist friends have some insights that I need, just like we have some insights to share with them. You know, we're all one body. You know, we're here to help each other. Yeah. But here's a few... Um, Again, we don't, have, we don't have to turn. These are probably scriptures you've heard before, and if you like to study them on your own later, you know, you can, certainly. But, you know, 1 Corinthians 14, 4, praying in tongue, other tongues will edify you or build you up. That edify is a, an architectural term, you know, the word edifice, referring to a building. It builds you up, strengthens, recharges like a battery. Oh, you can if you want. I mean, it doesn't matter. If you'd like to. Yeah, so. Moving on to the next one. That okay. Last 10, I, okay. I haven't heard that one. Okay. You want to go ahead and read it for us then? Okay. Forty-five and forty-six. Yes, sir. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Exactly, and that was the evidence that they recognized that they had had that experience, was they heard them speak in tongues and magnify God. And you know, it goes back to people who claim it's of the devil. You know, the devil's not going to have you magnify God. <laughs> You know? No. <laughs> okay. The next one, praying in tongues, builds up your faith and helps you trust God more fully. Jude 20. We've already looked at that one, so I won't go back there. 1 Corinthians 14, 15 through 17. Praying in tongues is a great way to give thanks to God. The King James uses the term give thanks well. E, praying in tongues helps us yield our tongues as well as the rest of our bodies to the control of the Holy Spirit. Let's go ahead and look at that one. James 3 8. We were talking about the importance of the tongue, so this fits right in with that. James after Hebrews. Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead and do verses 7 and 8. Bobby, you want to read that one? Yeah. All kinds of 
of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of a deadly poison. Exactly. That's strong words, but that's absolutely true. I mean, Mm -hmm. the tongue can rip someone apart, and we see it happen all the time. But, you know, one of the ways we can help yield to that is when we pray in other tongues every day. I mean, I can't overstate the importance of that. Okay, Romans 8, 26. Let's go to that one, too, because there's some insight there I'd like to share also. 8, 26. Okay. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And that expressed in words can be translated expressed in articulate speech. And verse 27, And the Father knows all hearts know what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. This, verse 28, is one of the most precious promises in the entire Bible, but it's often quoted completely ignoring the context. Mm -hmm. It's directly related to praying in other tongues. What we pray in the Spirit will work together for our good. And, you know, until we put that in operation, we can't fully, I mean, I'm not saying that we can't experience it to a degree, but not in the fullness that God wants us to. Mm Mm-hmm. 